Uh, before introducing the speakers, I'd like to mention some practical matters as usual. So uh, I'd like to ask you to remain muted uh, until it's your turn to ask a question. And if you want to ask a question during the Q&A, please use the uh, um, hand icon that you find in the tab um, with uh, reactions. Uh, then, uh, as I already mentioned before, uh, I think it would be nice if you could uh, switch on your camera unless you have Wi-Fi issues, because um, we think it's, um, it's nice to be able to see uh, the other participants. Um, if during the Q&A you notice that your connection is bad, feel free to um, ask a question by putting it in the chat. However, uh, apart from this, we would like to ask you to use the chat uh, sparsely and to, uh, and to talk rather than type. And I would also like to ask you to keep your questions short and focused so that as many uh, participants as possible uh, can participate in the discussions. So uh, today we have uh, three speakers, each of whom will speak for about 20 minutes. And after each paper, Professor Franks uh, will give a response. And after that, uh, the speakers will uh, give uh, some answers uh, to the questions that have been asked. And uh, finally, uh, each uh, um, part of the session will be concluded with a Q&A. Uh, I also wanted to mention already that we, you, that we usually keep open the Zoom meeting after the formal part so that uh, we can continue the conversation um, in a more or less informal manner. Um, okay, so... Uh, at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce the commentator, Professor Paul Franks. Uh, Paul Franks teaches philosophy, German, Judaic studies and religious studies at Yale University. He's the author of All or Nothing, Systematicity, Transcendental Arguments and Skepticism, published uh, with Harvard University Press in 2005. And he's also the author of numerous articles on Kant, post-Kantian philosophy, Jewish philosophy, and last but not least, of course, Maimon. His current research projects include a book on the Jewish dimension of modern European philosophy. And I'm sure that this book will also uh, pay attention uh, to Salomon Maimon. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very pleased uh, that uh, Paul Franks accepted immediately to respond to uh, the three papers. Uh, so I now turn to our first uh, speaker, Farhad Alavi. He has a BA in physics and an MA in philosophy from the University of Isfahan. He has a keen interest in the role of mathematics in Kant's philosophy, and he has published an article titled Reading Kant's Doctrine of Schematism Algebraically, published in 2020 in the Philosophical Forum. Uh, today, uh, evidently, he's not going to uh, talk about Kant, at least not too much, um, and uh, focusing on uh, Maimon. The title of his paper is Maimon's Differentials and Kant's Anticipations uh, of Perception. Uh, there is a handout uh, that I will uh, put in the chat uh, shortly. So, um, let, let us uh, welcome our first uh, speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I can now share the screen and start right away. Okay. Well, first of all, I would like to say how much I appreciate being in this significant event on my moon. I would like to thank our organizers for organizing this, especially Dr. Gabor for I know she has endeavored a lot to make this happen, so thank you very much for having me. Uh, I would like to begin by making some preliminary remarks on uh, Maimon's commentary, commentary today. Uh, there is this excitement surrounding Maimon from the beginning, from uh, Kant's comment that uh, this guy is among the few who understands my philosophy in his correspondence, and uh, Fichte's comments that uh, future generations will uh, mock us bitterly because Maimon has subverted and overturned the Kantian philosophy. 
And there is always this revolutionary picture uh, in depicting Maimon's philosophy, uh, which has uh, its contemporary uh, followers. And I would argue that there are two main attitudes uh, regarding Maimon's revolutionary uh, reading of Kant, and that would be the French predominant one, which regards Maimon's philosophy as a philosophy of eminence, uh, in which, of course, there is a genetic principle. And the other one is the one that focuses on the so-called Maimon's, Maimon's so-called empirical skepticism. And both, the atti both attitudes are revolutionary in the sense that they argue that Maimon has subverted the Kantian system. Well, I think the revolutionary picture somehow oversimplifies things uh, when we read both Maimon and Kant more closely. And from the very beginning, there are, I would like to point out that there are some points in the critical pure reason, which uh, the difference between Maimon and Kant seem to disappear. And uh, for example, there is this possibility of saying sensibility and understanding coming from the same source. And more importantly, space and time uh, are regarded as constructible objects in the critical pure reason. So when you open up every textbook on Kant, the first thing you learn is that, well, uh, in transcendental aesthetic, Kant says that uh, space and time are merely forms of intuition. What they don't tell you is that that's not the whole story in the transcendental deduction uh, and transcendental schematism. Uh, space and time are, are treated as objects and they are generated. And you can see, of course, the quotes. So there is always this oversimplification in, uh, in regarding the relation between Maimon and Kant. And the oversimplification begins by Maimon himself uh, in regarding Kant as a dualist. Uh, OK, my argument today would be my case study is Maimon's difference show in the first rule. Uh, and I want to just point out how the method of differentials that Maimon adopts in his first rule uh, has some correlates in the critical pure reason. I'm going only to focus on uh, the chapter in the transcendental analytic, analytical principles called anticipations of perception. I know that uh, the matter is, of course, uh, multifaceted and a comprehensive account would require referring to uh, Kant's different uh, transcendental deduction, transcendental schematism, and his uh, ideal of pure reason. During uh, my presentation, I would argue that the significance of Maimon's reading of Kant is that in the fact that he shows us a tension in Kant's text, and that is why Maimon is very interesting for me. And uh, I want to show you how this tension works in Kantian text and how it has developed uh, in the course of Kant's career. Well, in the first zoo, uh, it's one way of briefly putting what differentials are in the first zoo. In the first zoo, Maimon claims that he can address the question queries. Uh, that would be the lawful employment of concepts to intuition by recourse to a divine understanding. And uh, Maimon says, let's look at how things stand with an infinite understanding, uh, that of the divine. It, and in an infinite understanding, Maimon notes that uh, there is absolute homogeneity and every concept is given at the same time. So if by assumption, Maimon assumes that our own understanding is just the same as the divine, uh, and the difference is only in the degree. Then we can, if we understand how things stand the divine understanding, then we can make sense of uh, how we can make uh, the manifold of concepts and manifold of uh, intuitions homogeneous one another. And the argument works like this: the divine understanding is an intuitive understanding. And the crucial problem here is to ask why. Why is divine understanding intuitive? The argument goes like this. The infinity, uh, the manifold being infinite is uh, the cause of that intuitive character. So when you make the manifold of concepts infinite, 
you, in some sense, homogenize the difference uh, between two subsequent concepts. And uh, that is the mathematical trick that Maimon uses in introducing differentials. Suppose a, a synthetic proposition like uh, human beings are things. This uh, proposition can be breaking, broken down to so many other propositions. And uh, just suppose that in a divine understanding, this uh, breaking down can go to infinity. So whenever the manifold of anything, concepts or anything else, goes to infinity, some uh, homogeneity is, is produced. And uh, the minimal difference between the two subsequent uh, member of that infinite series is called differential. So in this sense, differentials are infinitely small. But differentials are not merely uh, what is infinitely, uh, what are infinitely small. That would be the necessary condition for defining uh, differentials. The sufficient condition, are, are, uh, I argue, is that you regard that minimal difference itself as a rule and uh, that it has some mathematical background here. So Maimon says that differentials serve as principles to explain how objects arise. So the minimal difference between uh, any of subsequent, uh, say, concepts uh, show us how uh, the, what the difference is and how that concept can arise. So when you can grasp the principle, the law, uh, of that arising, you in some sense uh, have made that concept into a real concept. So uh, in, a, uh, in a general way, when you distinguish some marks in some particulars and generalize uh, by making some concepts, uh, that is not enough to make a manifold homogeneous. Uh, by introducing differentials, Maimon goes in the direction of making known of definitions real. So uh, as principles, they show us how a concept arises. So the, uh, the question uh, how is already inscribed in the question what the object is. So uh, the trick would be to make the homogeneous a function of understanding to what differentials are uh, concepts of understanding as that which can think, uh, Manon says, objects as arising are applied to differentials, not objects. And uh, there would be no problem as regards the question who it is. And that is in some sense how the idea of differentials uh, is introduced in Maimon's Versuch. And you can see the footnote to Maimon's uh, second chapter in which he says, well, I know that this is uh, an obscure notion, but I'm use of, uh, I'm, making use of uh, Leibniz system of modelology. So having that in mind, how differentials work in making the manifold infinite and uh, thereby making it homogeneous, uh, I would argue that the same function is at work in Kant's anticipation of perception. And there are some uh, differences, some crucial differences uh, in method that uh, separate these two thinkers. So uh, this, Anticipations chapter is a very controversial one, and there is no consensus on how it should be read. I read you some comments from Geyer and Longuones. Uh, Geyer, for example, says that the principle of intensive magnitude, intensive magnitude as that which is discussed in this chapter of anticipations, lacks any a priori basis, let alone a clear place in Kant's theory of time determination, and that would be schematism. By extending continuity to sensation, Kant, after all, seems to deny the reducible duality of matter and form of appearances, thereby contradicting the cardinal tenet of critical philosophy. And uh, we know that there is a predominant view of uh, reading Kant in which uh, Kant is separated from a rationalist tradition in which there is this idea of perfection. Uh, but in this chapter, reality as regarded, is regarded as something uh, that has a degree. So there is uh, somehow a perfectionist view uh, in, a tra in, in a rationalist tradition is at work. And that would challenge some, uh, some readings, which 
try to depict Kant uh, completely detached from this rationalist point of view. Uh, I would suggest that there is a tension here that led Kant to uh, go in the direction of metaphysical foundations, opus postumum, uh, and that is how matter is uh, regarded a priori. So I take here uh, Marshall Pirot, uh, comment on uh, Solomon Maimon, in which he says that the, the genetic preoccupation is alien to Kant. And uh, as you can see in your handout, uh, there is, of course, this idea of uh, genetic function at work in Kant's anticipations. And uh, these two principles, I mean, axioms of intuition and the anticipations of perceptions, which come rightly after the chapter on schematism, Kant says, uh, generate both the matter and the formal appearances, according to mathematical synthesis. So there is a continuity between form and matter discussed in this section. And I would argue that there is the same function of differentials at work here. So when Kant says that from the empirical consciousness to pure consciousness, a gradual alteration is possible, he's somehow using this differential method. So the gradual alteration would be the infinite analysis in which you, when you make uh, an infinite manifold, the difference between two subsequent members vanishes and you can regard them analytically inscribed in one another. So that there would be no synthetic and there would be no query's question. And the way Kant argues in this section uh, is the same. He lets, he lets the manifold grow to infinity by reducing it. He says, uh, given a magnitude, it has a degree. We can reduce its degree by approximating it to zero. And that is actually an infinite analysis in which uh, it meets uh, the necessary condition that we discussed uh, in is, is necessary in the definition of differentials. Another take that is very interesting in this chapter is that Kant regards these uh, passing magnitudes, these intensive magnitudes as that which fills time. He says uh, fills time in, in the anticipation and further in the metaphysical foundation that, that there is this matter of filling space. But here in this chapter, that is only filling time. So in a sense, the very definition of intensive magnitudes is the relation between the differential of some reality to the relation, its relation to the differential of time. And it's a mathematical definition that when you divide two differentials, you have an intensive magnitude. And the, the difference with Maimon here is that Maimon says that every empirical, say, uh, perception has its differentials. And consciousness arises when the understanding compares those differentials. For example, you have this uh, perception of the color red. Uh, there is a differential corresponding to that. And there is the other differential corresponding to the uh, color green. And the understanding relates to these differentials and makes sense of the difference uh, that they have and consciousness arises. But in Kant, there would be no comparison between two different things. That is, uh, intensive magnitudes in Kant are uh, only a property of feeling time and space. So it is why Kant says that uh, intensive magnitudes are apprehended instantaneously. And we can see the similarity that it has with the role of divine understanding in which uh, an infinite manifold is apprehended uh, instantaneously. This is the same with uh, the intensive magnitudes. And uh, Kant, in some sense, is uh, making use of the same method in thinking the relation between the intensive and extensive magnitudes. What is crucial here in this chapter is the possibility of physics, which is uh, very innovative in Kant, and it has led to many difficulties. I, I think this is a clue to understand even Maimon's empirical skepticism, because there is a sense of causality in this chapter, which Kant discusses only in passing. He says we can regard reality as a cause. Uh, this notion is completely different from the notion of 
of hypothetical judgments in the analogies where, uh, where causality is discussed. In a very fundamental way, from this chapter, we understand what physics is. The relation between pure to empirical consciousness as the relation between spatial temporal forms to what is there in a the matter is exactly what physics is. So in a very basic sense, you cannot find any branch of physics without any differential equations. There is no physics without differential equations. And intensive magnitudes in a basic sense are differential equations. But, but I would say that Kant's mathematics is trivial and he cannot step towards understanding what these differential equations uh, really are in the sense that they anticipate uh, perception. So there is a tension that I would suggest that Kant is struggling with and uh, Maimon's way of putting differentials at the core of the critical pure reason can uh, help us better grasp the Kantian tension, which starts with the assumption that mathematical uh, proposition are synthetic, and that is the problem of the infinite series in Kant. And the struggle goes on in, in this chapter with intensive magnitudes, and then um, Kant goes on in his later works to overcome this problem. Some concluding remarks here. It is true, you can see in your handle and the way I discuss it, that there is this continuity between the empirical, the posteriori and the a priori in, in Kant. And Kant is using uh, infinite analysis here. And uh, the idea is that uh, what is real in experience, what is given can be generated continuously. So we attribute a continuous degree to what is given in, in in experience, and that would be the transcendental ground of any reality. Uh, and when Maimon insists that understanding can think of objects as arising, uh, he's in some sense uh, using uh, Kant's schema of reality, the schema of reality as uh, that which is generated in time, continuously. But the difference is that uh, here, Kant confines reality only to sensation or the degree of filling space and time, but that's not the case in my mind. He uses differentials in much broader sense. So we have two conceptions of uh, unity in Kant. And in this lies the difference between Kant and Maimon and the significance of Maimon's version of this. Uh, in the transcendental analytic, the unity of the manifold of intuition is guaranteed by uh, the Kant's theory of perception. The synthetic unity of perception is, uh, which has the last word, it gives the unity of the manifold. But in the transcendental dialectic, that's not the case. We have a projected unity. We have reason in its hypothetical use, or in terms of the third critic, uh, we have some heuristic function. So, because uh, the manifold of concepts cannot be unified by uh, any apperception. So these two infinities, the, manif uh, the infinite manifold of intuition and the infinite manifold of concepts are unified in Kant in different terms, in transcendental analytic and transcendental dialectic. But Maimon would remind us that the method of differentials, you know, if we adopt this method, there, then there would be no uh, fundamental difference with, with, uh, between these two ways of unifying the manifold. So my last word is that Maimon's reading of uh, Kant and putting the idea of differentials to address the question criteria is uh, very innovative because you know Maimon uh, adopts uh, differentials to the realm of mathematics and that is the struggle uh, Kant uh, is facing in defining what an objective knowledge is. And by reading both Maimon and Kant, we can grasp that uh, what that struggle is. In some sense, that struggle is the possibility of physics. Uh, and Kant has this obsession to address this problem through uh, the course of his career. And that is, to me, the significance of Maimon with regard to Kant. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Frau Haas. Uh, that was uh, really very interesting and also uh, sometimes uh, challenging. So I now um, give the floor to Paul Franks for his comments. Well, thanks very much, first of all, for inviting me to participate in this workshop on Maimon. I think Maimon is really important and challenging thinker. And I'm so glad to see people writing about him in this, uh, uh, at this high level. Um, and Farhad, you, you talk about um, Maimon's account of differentials, which is clearly very central to his, uh, to his thinking, certainly in his in engagement with Kant and to his alternative resolution of the questio quid juris. Um, I, I just have some, some questions here. Um, I think one of the pitfalls of, of working on Maimon or for that matter Fichte, um, people who are very sort of close to Kant on the one hand, and yet in another sense, very original thinkers, is that one has the great temptation, and almost a necessary temptation, either to assimilate Kant to their position or to set up Kant as a sort of a straw man um, to whose position Maimon's or Fichte's position is, is preferable. Um, and I think it's almost unavoidable to go through those stages. And I, I wonder if uh, you are not falling a little bit into the first temptation when you say, uh, you said at the, in the last slide, I think that there's the, the, the Kantian text is open to a Maimonian reading. Um, at the same time, you also emphasize the differences between them. So to me, the differences seem more significant than uh, the similarities, although I certainly agree with you that Kant's account of intensive magnitude in the anticipations is somewhat neglected and that it contains, to a certain extent, um, some of the seeds of Maimon's view. So I want to... Um, so to think with you a little bit about how that's supposed to go and what the differences between Kant and Maimon are and what's really at stake in those differences. Um, so one very clear difference, which I'm not sure, but it could be that you underestimate is the, the role of the divine understanding in Maimon's view. Um, now you do say, of course, at the at the end of the uh, in, in the last slide, that this would play a regulative role for Kant, and not a constitutive role, and so on. Um, but at least in the written version of the paper um, that I had been given before, you seem to be saying a little bit more than that, um, and to suggest that there's some Kantian idea of the way the divine understanding operates with respect to the infinite. Um, I don't. I, I wasn't able to download the slides just now, so I can't go back to that. But um, you said something about um, the way in which concept and intuition would operate within the divine understanding. Perhaps we can go back to that in a minute and you can explain it to us. Um, because I would have thought that there would be fundamentally no distinction. Uh, good, okay. Um, See which one is it? Um, no. it will... I think it's yes. here. Okay, here, yeah. In an infinite understanding, there's always homo homogeneity between concepts and their intuition. But you know, well, homogeneity is one thing, but I would have thought within an infinite understanding, there would be no room for the distinction between the concept and intuition at all. Um, so it wouldn't even be a question of homogeneity. Um, one could either think of it as sort of purely conceptual or one could think about it as purely intuitive. Either way, you would not need both concept and intuition. Um, now, th there are different ways in which Kant himself talks about uh, the infinite understanding. So I'm not sure if this is meant to relate to say, you know, the way he characterizes it in section 77 to 78 of the third critique. I'm not sure because that is a bit different it seems to me from the way he characterizes it in the critique of pure understanding. But at any rate, in, 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 the, in the first critique, um, I, I do not see that you could use the notion of homogeneity between concept and intuition to characterize the divine understanding. I don't, I, I don't see how that would work. Um, 
I understand that within Maimon's thinking, it's a bit different. And this is precisely where it seems as though Maimon quite explicitly is appealing to a much more Leibnizian conception of both the divine understanding and of uh, the foundations of calculus. Uh, and, and this seems to me very crucial. Um, and maybe it's suggested, so I'm not sure if this is a difference from what you're saying, but maybe it's suggested by what you say at the end about the synthetic character of mathematical judgment according to Kant. Fundamentally in the anticipations, I would suggest Kant employs a Newtonian understanding of calculus and he uses Newtonian language of fluxions rather than a Leibnizian conception of uh, differentials and the infinitesimal and so on. Um, and this seems to be fundamentally related to the role of space and time within Kant's thinking. They are uh, space and time or space time taken together is absolutely fundamental for the schematization of these mathematical categories. Um, it would appear, however, that on Maimon's view, either space time is reducible to something else, a view that he occasionally suggests in the uh, in the essay and had actually stated in his original letter in Kant. And then I think according to the work of Gideon Freudenthal, Maimon realized that wasn't going to work. So if space time is not reducible to something else, then it must be in principle eliminable, which is basically Leibniz's view. But you know, in Leibniz's view, it's eliminable only, only for God. It's not eliminable for human beings. Um, it could be that that Maimon thinks through the advancement of mathematics, it would be possible to eliminate any reference to space and time with respect to the basic notions of extensive and intensive magnitude. And on that score, he would seem to be more in tune with the actual development of the history of mathematics in the 19th and 20th centuries than Kant. So this may be, this differentiation is not meant on my part to um, enforce any sort of Kantian orthodoxy. It may just be that Maimon, as I say, is, is more in tune with what's going on among the mathematicians at the time than Kant, um, who, of course, but you know, not for not for negligible reasons, um, insists on Euclidean geometry and so on. Um, so I think that may be perhaps the, the fundamental thing that is at stake here. Um, but it's connected to a, an even deeper issue, I think, which is is about um, you know uh, the de the determinacy of space and time. Um, for Kant, all of that is contingent and given. Uh, there are just features of space and time, uh, its Euclidean character, the irreversibility of time and so on, which are fundamentally contingent. And yet from our point of view as human beings, uh, necessary features of the form of our sensibility. And that is one of Kant's most original notions. Um, but it seems to me uh, that Maimon rejects it. Uh, and he rejects it in principle uh, because it cannot fit with the principle of sufficient reason, which from a Leibnizian point of view would be, you know, at least a good reason. Um, so I'm wondering what, what, what you think about this. Perhaps you could explain a little bit more about uh, the role of divine understanding within your view of Kant, um, and then perhaps say a bit more about what's at stake fundamentally with respect to space and time as the form of sensibility uh, within the um, disagreement between Maimon and Kant. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, you mentioned what the great difference is. Uh, I see the great difference, uh, and here uh, the role of divine understanding is at work, is uh, Kant's doctrine of apperception. So in the transcendental analytic, we have the unity of an infinite manifold uh, and this unity is brought to us by a perception. Uh, th this I cannot find in my mind. So th th this is the uh, great difference that I see. Uh, and here in the transcendental deduction, Kant notes divine understanding by saying that the only way I can make sense of what is given is through a divine understanding. But that's not the case, so let's make another argument. So this is this, uh, there is this uh, 
discussion of divine understanding. Uh, but when I compare this uh, reference to divine understanding in the transcendental deduction to what is happening in the anticipations chapter, I see exactly the same rule because uh, by definition, uh, and you're right, I might uh, a little put it wrongly because in uh, the function of divine understanding is that you have a manifold which is instantaneously given and that manifold is infinite. And in the anticipation chapter, we have the same thing. You have uh, the reality which is given as a whole instantaneously. And to make sense of what that whole is, you have to go through an infinite analysis by reducing that reality to homogeneous parts. And, and when your analysis becomes infinite uh, parts, the difference be between parts uh, diminishes and the manifold becomes homogeneous. So uh, I see that uh, for Kant, uh, uh, it is forbidden to use the one understanding in deriving uh, the judgments, uh, a priori judgments, but uh, his account of reality, uh, I would say, uh, corresponds to the one understanding in a very implicit way. So the similarity is that we have something which is given as a whole, and then we should make sense of what the parts are. And, and that's to me somehow similar to what Maimon says about the role of infinite understanding. And uh, about the role of mathematics and differentials, I would somehow defend uh, Kant's view of uh, synthetic. You know, you cannot create a space, even in mathematics, you have to pre presuppose uh, the intuition of real numbers to be able to uh, perform any uh, integration. So space and time as intuition, which Kant uh, uh, insists on, is somehow neglectable, even in today's mathematics. And you know, there are all these discussions about uh, intuitionism in uh, mathematics. And that, that is not uh, one-sided to my mind's favor, I would say. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, did I cover all your questions? Well, I think I think for that uh, maybe uh, maybe we conclude this part here. Okay. Yes, I, I thought that your answers were very. I would uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Franks for responding and being here. It's really great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now uh, the the floor is open for questions. Um, yes, uh, Daniel, please. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, yeah. fine, great. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot for this very uh, interesting talk. Um, I've got a question concerning the transcendental deduction. Um, in the um, in the second version of the deduction, so in the transcendental deduction in the um, second edition of the Critique of Pure Reason, um, Kant uh, sometimes uses uh, the concept of an um, yeah infinite uh, sorry not infinite uh, intuitive understanding, uh, anschauender Verstand, um, and uh, this uh, uh, this understanding, which is also um, also yeah, described as some kind of divine understanding. Uh, it's characterized by um, by saying that uh, this type of or this this form of understanding is not uh, dependent on uh, anything anything given, uh, but it uh, produces um, its uh, contents of of knowledge completely by its own. Um, and uh, do, do you do you see any connection between uh, this um, this concept uh, in the trans in the second transcendental deduction? Um, to uh, to Maimon's um, yeah concept of an infinite understanding in the essay. Yes, exactly. That was one of my points in, in the slides. Uh, uh, the passage you're referring to is where Kant uh, says that the possibility of understanding uh, to the grasp a priori what is given uh, can be understood uh, in an intuitive uh, understanding. And I try to explicate on how divine understanding becomes intuitive. Uh, uh, I said, because the manifold is infinite and th th this is uh, 
uh, why the divine understanding is at the same time in, uh, intuitive. Everything is present in, in an instant. Uh, so yes, uh, that's exactly my point. Thanks, thanks a lot. Okay, uh, Jonathan is next. Uh, do you read me? Yes. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks for the nice talk. I, I have a have a question. Uh, yeah, concerning the status of of um, of the transcendental aesthetics for for the yeah somehow the, the difference between between Kant and and Maimon in your in your talk. Um, and yeah, you somehow said yeah sometimes there are a bit 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 uh, superficial uh, oppositions made between uh, Kant and and Maimon in this respect and and it, and as far as I understood your talk, you wanted to, to, to make a point that, that it's more about the, the difference in the understanding of, of transcendental um, 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 perception. Um, but, 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 but I would like to, uh, to, to ask how, yeah, how, you make, how you make sense of, of these like, yeah, more, more Leibnizian uh, intuitions of, of Maimon, of, of space being... Um, uh, of space, space and time um, being um, being understandable mm -hmm. in terms of relations and 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 by the and in a yeah and as be, um, and you said also in, in Kant there's a notion of them being um, being generated yeah by by, by this um, and being made homogeneous by the by the by the differentials but but I would say there's a there's a crucial crucial difference namely that uh, that Kant uh, um, presupposes um, yeah some kind of of, um, of of given given unity of of, of space time in its in its uh, um, extensivity and and uh, somehow this this extensiveness is, is also first first given and, and it's given in a somehow somehow weakly weakly unified unified way which is then the basis uh, both for for the for the homogenization by um, by yeah by, by differentials but but also for the for the transcendental uh, um, deduction um, at least at least this is how this is how uh, uh, Dieter Henrich reads it when um, um, when, when trying to understand that the transcendental deduction uh, relates the, the unity of of, um, of transcendental perception to these yeah somehow somehow weaker unity which is in uh, intuition itself and I would say in, in my mind there's no such there's no such unity of of uh, of space time which is simply given to uh, to man but but there are only those those relations out of which out of which uh, uh, unity, uh, in space time can be can be generated okay thank you johnson i think that uh, that maybe you can conclude here is that okay yeah 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 it, that was the, that was the plan i was okay good <laughs> that's it yes i'm with you that their notions of differentials uh, is uh, their notions are different uh, i would say that uh, my mistake is magnesium and he goes in the direction of, of what uh, topology is uh, analysis issues uh, that is employing differentials in mathematics itself. So for Kant, it is not a matter of mathematics. Mathematics is synthetic. But uh, it, the, the question here is the application of uh, magnitudes to, to reality, to, to, to nature. And that is one of the main differences between my most writings and take and Kant, I, uh, I feel. And, with regard to the unity that uh, you said, uh, I would say that there is a moment in Kant's text that uh, I don't know where, but he says that there is the same uh, uh, unity uh, in, which is acting in different uh, manifolds. So that is why I say Kant's text is still open to my money interpretation. There are so many uh, aspects of transcendental deduction which is not explored yet. Uh, and uh, uh, there are these Maimonian, uh, Maimonian moments in the transcendental deduction uh, too. So I should be brief. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Uh, Timothy, a final question? Oh, okay. Um, I'm not quite sure if this is even a good question. I'm just wondering, uh, differentials, are they 
are they things that the finite subject employs to make sense of reality or are, are the, do they constitute the, the reality itself? Uh, are, are they real entities are, are already there? That's it. Differentials by definition, <laughs> by definition are relations. So uh, Maimon would say that you have to presuppose some relation before the reality is given to you. And, and differentials are a way of making sense of those pre-given relations. So uh, uh, that, and uh, uh, you can, of course, uh, divide the manifold to uh, uh, add, add infinitum and uh, reach these infinitely small beings. But uh, the crucial point is that you, it is somehow like Nisian, you uh, have to assume that the idea of the whole is already presupposed in that infinitely small thing which constructs re reality. Uh, so uh, I think that's why uh, Maimon has that footnote in, in which he uh, alludes to uh, Leibniz monadology. Because monads, uh, uh, there is this um, representation of the world, you know, in every monad it represents the world from different uh, perspectives. Uh, and Maimon sees uh, affinity between differentials and monadology there. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, Farhat. Uh, so I now turn over to our second speaker, Emily Fitton. Uh, she completed her PhD in 2018 at University of Essex, where she currently teaches academic writing. Uh, she wrote her PhD thesis on the topic of Maimonian skepticism, and she currently has particular interest in the influence of such skepticism on Fichte's Grundlage. Yes, so you go, uh, from Maimon uh, to Fichte. Um, the title of her talk today is Maimon on causal skepticism and the status of the hypothetical judgment. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, thank you. And thank you uh, so much for inviting me to, to speak at your workshop. Um, so the purpose of uh, my presentation today is to make sense of a passage from Maimon 1791, uh, Wörterbuch, and um, actually that's the passage that you can see on the left there in, in German, and I'll have a look at the English translation in a second. Um, but the essential argument there seems to be that there's some kind of circularity um, in Kant's attempt to, um, to deduce the categories or to show the objective validity of the categories. So we have the, the passage here then in translation. Um, before I look at that, I just want to highlight that Maimon here talks about forms. At the moment, I'm not going to say what that means, um, but if we can just keep in mind, this could be logical forms. Um, this could be the categories of the understanding. Um, so the passage is as follows. Uh, your, by which means Kant's explanation is circular in that you take these forms to be necessary conditions of experience, which you presuppose as fact, so that you can prove the reality of these forms. You must therefore show that the principle of association doesn't suffice to explain these forms. You must further show that these forms already have their reality in the understanding a priori, or you must prove the fact that we use them with object of experience if you want to overturn the Kantian, sorry, overturn the skeptical system. So I suggest that this passage is bringing together two um, lines of Maimonian sceptical argument. The first of these is the questio facti or the question of fact. And the second one, which I'm gonna be more concerned with today is what I'm gonna call Maimon's logical skepticism. Um, now it's important to note, obviously Maimon talks about forms in the plural in this passage. I'm going to focus um, today on the category of causality in the form of the hypothetical judgment. But it's worth bearing in mind that Maimon's skepticism is wider. He's not just talking about um, those particular forms and categories. So the quaestio facti, the question of fact, is going to have to do with uh, the objective validity of causal judgments. Maimon's argument is going to be that Kant somehow fails in his attempt to establish the objective validity of the category of causality. The second part, what I'm calling logical skepticism, has to do with the a priori status of the hypothetical judgment or the logical status of the hypothetical judgment. Maimon's concerned that Kant hasn't really shown 
uh, that the hypothetical judgment is a genuine logical form. Now, my claim is that actually these two lines of skeptical argument come together um, in Maimon's accusation of circularity. So his position is going to be that um, for Kant, the objective validity of the causal judgment in some sense rests on the logical status of the hypothetical. It's dependent on uh, the hypothetical judgment having a genuine logical status. But that in turn, at the same time, the hypothetical judgment, the logical status of the hypothetical judgment in turn rests on the objective validity of the causal judgment. So Kant is stuck uh, in this circularity. Um, in keeping with that, then I'm going to have two parts to this presentation. So the first part, I'm going to ask, why should we care about the status of the hypothetical judgment? Or in other words, why does the status of the hypothetical judgment matter when we're thinking about the objective validity of causal judgments? In the second part, I'm going to think about Maimon's logical scepticism. Um, so what is the problem with the hypothetical judgment? Why does Maimon think that that ultimately rests on or the, the logical status of the judgment ultimately rests on um, the objective validity of the causal judgment. Part one then, so why should we care about the status of the hypothetical judgment? Um, well, I want to start with just a very brief recap um, of, of Kant's approach to causal skepticism. So as Kant sees it, the problem is as follows. To the synthesis of cause and effect, there belongs a dignity which cannot be empirically expressed namely that the effect, the effect not only succeeds upon the cause, but it's posited through and arises out of it. So of course, there are two key things here. The first is that there's this idea of efficacy, right? There's something about uh, causality that's more than just the um, conjunction of presentations. And importantly, that's not something that can be uh, empirically expressed, right? It's not something that we can point to uh, a particular phenomenon experience and say, Oh, uh, that's, you know, that's uh, efficacy. What's Kant's solution to this? Well, um, in the transcendental deduction, to some extent, uh, and also in the analogies, it's something like the following. So we don't have access to objective time or objective temporal succession. Um, so we have to make judgments about it based on subjective succession uh, or based on our judgments about subjective succession. Now, um, Maimon says that, well, sorry, Kant says that we do this by applying judgments of um, necessary succession. Right? So we judge that a succession is necessary, just is to judge that it's uh, in some sense objective. Now, it's really important to note that, um, that this claim that causal judgments involve necessity is really key for Kant because it allows him to make the further claim that what we're looking for when we're trying to decide which judgment or which uh, concept is doing the work here, um, it allows him to claim that we're looking for a category of the understanding. Only a category of the understanding is going to be able to give us uh, necessity, right? So the concept which carries with it a necessity of synthetic unity can only be a pure concept that lies in the understanding. What does this all mean? Well, in one sense, it means that causality has objective validity just because it's constitutive of objectivity, right? It, we have to employ the concept to uh, have experience of an object or to think of an object uh, in experience at all. Um, but the fact that it's a category also gives it genuine objective validity. It's not just a psychological construct of some kind, uh, it's a, a real external object. So, why does Maimon question um, Kant's argument then? Well, his um, quaestio facti scepticism really involves questioning whether our judgments or our causal judgments really do involve necessity. And he suggests, well, I can just take the human skeptical position. I can say, well, there aren't any experiential propositions properly so-called expressing necessity. And if I say this concept is taken from experience, I understand by this mere perception containing a merely subjective necessity arising from habit, which is wrongly passed off as an objective necessity. Um, so it's a kind of strange formulation to call it subjective necessity because, you know, necessity isn't something we can get at by our experience. But I think the idea is that it's a not really a genuine necessity, right? It's a, a feeling rather than a, a genuine concept. What does this mean? Well, 
it means we no longer have to look to the categories for uh, an explanation of, of the category or, or the concept of causality. So the origins of the concept become psychological. And in turn, that means that, okay, while we might accept a certain kind of objective validity, the object that, that, um, that we can legitimately apply the concept to isn't the object of the transcendental deduction. It's going to be a kind of psychological object. As Kant puts it himself in the transcendental deduction, if this be the situation, all our insight resting on the supposed objective validity of our judgments is nothing but sheer illusion. Okay, so he's not going to be particularly happy about that. But so far, this has assumed that um, Kant does presuppose the necessity of causal judgments. And actually, there are reasons that are independent of the analogies um, for thinking that uh, causal judgments might involve necessity. One of those is that the natural sciences, or at least Kant thinks that the natural sciences involve judgments of causal necessity. Um, that's not something that I uh, have time to go into now, um, but uh, Freudenthal has a, a really good paper on this. Um, it depends upon Kant's arguments in the metaphysical foundations. But there is a second reason that I do want to look at today. Um, and if we look at that, this passage here from the Transcendental Deduction, um, that gives us a sense of what it might be. So Kant says that a priori of the categories has been proved in the metaphysical deduction through their complete agreement with the general logical functions of thought. So actually, Kant can argue that the category of causality does involve necessity because it has these a priori origins and um, the reason that we think it has those a priori origins is because it has this, uh, this identical structure uh, with the hypothetical judgment. Part two then. So, so far I've argued that Kant does have a, uh, an alternative means of securing the objective validity of the uh, concept of causality, but it's gonna rest on the status of the hypothetical judgment. So why does Maimon think that the hypothetical judgment uh, might be problematic. Well, his general argument is going to be as follows. This form, by which he means the hypothetical, has no meaning other than the categorical meaning, and um, it's used in logic merely as a result of a deception with respect to its use. So what does he mean by this? Well, in order to make sense of it, first of all, um, we need to think about what constitutes gen genuine general logic for, for Kant. And um, in the first critique, in the first critique, sorry, he defines it uh, in the following way: absolutely necessary rules of thought, without which there could be no employment whatsoever of the understanding. So, if it's going to be a genuine logical form, it's going to have to be irreducible and indispensable. Okay, we can't reduce it to other more basic um, logical forms. We we can't um, get rid of it without somehow. Um, damaging our understanding or limiting our understanding. And of course, the origins cannot be psychological um, because then it cannot serve as uh, the, the kind of basic um, structure of reality. Okay, um, now Kant, doesn't make a, Kant makes a distinction here that's quite uh, useful between pure general logic and applied general logic. Um, so he thinks that only pure general logic is real, genuine logic. Um, but there are mental processes that help us to, um, to arrive at the truth, if you like. Um, but these would belong to applied general logic. So these would be a sort of pseudo logic. Um, these would have psychological origins. They might be useful in knowledge acquisition. They might be useful in understanding. Um, but they're not actually essential. And so they're not going to belong to pure general logic. So Maimon's argument is going to be that the hypothetical is one of those. It's one of those forms that belongs to applied general logic rather than pure general logic. So where does uh, Maimon's claim come from then? Well, in order to understand it, we have to look back at um, Wolf's 1713 German logic. And Wolf makes this claim that the categorical and the hypothetical distinction is one of expression and not of substance. Remember that if it's gonna to belong to pure general logic, it can't be reducible uh, to another logical form. 
So if it's true that the hypothetical and categorical distinction is just uh, one of expression, then we shouldn't really have uh, the hypothetical there as its own distinct form. So his argument is that um, in a categorical judgment, we've sufficiently determined the subject. So if we look at this slightly unusual example that he gives, uh, the, the warm stone makes the bed warm. I'm imagining this as some kind of hot water bottle. Um, but the, the argument there is that, okay, um, it's a very particular type of stone that has the property of making the bed warm. In the hypothetical judgment, we're saying the same thing, um, but we only predicate that property um, problematically, right? So we say, if the stone is warm, then it makes the bed warm. It's not just any stone, it's a particular type of stone. Uh, it's the one that's warm. So the two judgments express differently, but having the same logical content. So why does Kant, um, obviously he's very familiar with Wolf, why does he include the hypothetical in his table of judgments? Well, he doesn't give us much to go on in the first critique, um, but he does say this, categorical judgments relate to concepts, Hypoth hypothetical judgments relate to propositions. Now, in itself, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a, a, a logical difference between these two judgment forms. What we're interested in is the, um, the relation between the terms, not the nature of the terms of the judgment themselves. Um, but it does have implications. So if we go to the Yesha logic, uh, we can see um, that, Kant, uh, yeah, that Kant argues that in the categorical judgment, I maintain the thing directly in the hypothetical judgment only under a condition expressed problematically. Okay, so the reason is that, um, or this is, has to do with what we would now term existential import, right? Because a hypothetical judgment um, relates to propositions, each of those propositions themselves has a truth functionality. And you can talk about the relationship between them, even if both of those propositions are, fa are false. So we can say that the hypothetical judgment lacks existential import. In the case of the categorical, Kant's position is, well, I can't do that. I'm relating to concepts. I can't help but assert the reality of the object um, that the judgment's about. Now, the next step is one that I'm making. So it's maybe a little bit dodgy, um, but I, can, I think there's kind of an intuitive um, leap that we can make here from this lack of existential import to the um, ground consequence structure. Because the hypothetical judgment kind of holds independently of um, existential claims, independently of circumstances, this allows us to locate the source of the, um, the relationship, if you like, in the, in the nature of the terms themselves, rather than in some other um, existential conditions. Right. So this gives the hypothetical judgment its ground consequence structure. It makes the relationship between the hypothetical and the categorical fundamentally different and allows Kant to uh, include the hypothetical within his table of judgments. Okay, so what's Maimon's position going to be? In one sense, we might think that he just returns to uh, to the Wolfian position. I won't read this out, but there are several places where he makes... Uh, claims that are very similar to Wolf. So here he's saying, you know, if you, th if you think the condition uh, and so on. Um, but I don't think that Maimon is um, just returning to the Wolfian position. I think he does accept that there's a distinction between the categorical uh, and hypothetical forms. But his argument is going to be that that only holds in a very specific um, circumstance and that's um, when we think about uh, natural events right so it only holds if we think that um, that we really do make causal judgments uh, involving judgments of necessity now I don't have time to think about um, or too much about why that's the case. He goes through um, many different examples from mathematics, for example, to explain why a mathematical judgment um, can be expressed in categorically or, or as a hypothetical, and, um, and the, there's no difference, logically speaking. But I think the main reason we might disagree with Maimon is to, if, if we take an example 
like the following hypothetical judgment. If I say, if tomorrow is Tuesday, then today is Monday. Right. Obviously, I'm not making a causal claim there. I'm not saying that um, today is Monday and that's somehow a product of tomorrow being Tuesday in the way that I might do when I'm talking about causal um, necessity. But there's a similar kind of process going on in my reasoning, right? The reason that I judge that um, that today is Monday is that tomorrow is Tuesday. So I might say, well, look, that's the, the kind of um, property that makes hypothetical judgments distinct. But I think it's important that we remember that um, just because we use a particular type of judgment, that doesn't mean it belongs to pure general logic for Kant. It has to be, um, it has to be indispensable, right? It has to be um, absolutely necessary. And so I think Maimon could say, well, yes, we make these kinds of judgments, but they're examples of, um, of applied general logic. They don't represent genuine kind of logical structures. Okay, so Maimon's position is we only come across these judgments in our judgments about natural events, right? We only come across genuine hypotheticals in our judgments about natural events. And then he goes on to say, but look, if this too is denied by claiming that in fact, we don't have any judgments of experience expressing objective necessity, but only subjective judgments of experience that have become necessary through habit, then the concept of a hypothetical judgment would be and would remain merely problematic. So once we start to rely on, on objective validity of, of causal judgments, once we start to rely on the, the reality of natural causality or the objective validity of natural causality, um, we're, we're going to get into problems because we've already kind of established by way of the quaestio facti that that objective validity is going to be dependent on um, the logical status of the hypothetical judgment. So I suggest that um, this is the circularity that Maimon's diagnosing in Kant's argument. So there's the, the first thing we want to determine. We want to determine that causal judgments have objective validity. There's the second thing that we want to determine that the hypothetical is a genuine logical form. Well, the quaestio fact is going to show us that the, the um, objective validity of causal judgments is dependent upon uh, the logical status of the hypothetical. And at the same time, Maimon's logical skepticism is going to show us that the hypothetical or the logical status of the hypothetical judgment is ultimately going to depend upon uh, the actuality of, of genuine causal judgments involving judgments of necessity. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, this was uh, very clear and interesting. And um, um, I suppose that Paul Franks will have some comments for you. Yes, thank you very much for that paper. I think you, you've raised a very important issue, not only with respect to the interpretation of Maimon and Kant, but an important issue in the philosophy of logic. I think it remains a major issue um, whether the um, conditional in, in this way should be taken as a logical form, and if so, how it should be interpreted. You know, within uh, truth functional logic, it's sometimes called, I guess, material implication, and then um, one gets the so-called paradoxes of material implication as a result of that. So that you know, if the um, uh, if the consequent is is true, then the conditional is, is also going to be true, even if the antecedent is false, and uh, and so on. Um, and, and therefore, logicians have tried various alternatives to the truth functional interpretation, relevance, logic, and, and so on. But I think that just really raises the question whether if, if it has to be somehow relevant, if, if um, the antecedent has to be relevant to the, to the consequent, um, it's question raised, arises whether we're really dealing with a general logical form now, or whether we're dealing with something that is um, on a more applied level. Um, so I, I think this remains an important question and of course you know the conditional is not the same as uh, inference either um, where you would also get some sort of if then relationship but that that would be uh, as as we know from uh, um, from Lewis Carroll you you can't just assimilate um, 
inference to um, the conditional either. Otherwise, you get into all sorts of problems. So I think this is really a big, a big issue. So uh, for Kant, uh, as I think you, you rightly suggest, um, there, there's sort of two different um, sorts of argument that he might give. And it's really unclear to what extent one side of the argument shapes the other. So on the one side, you've got the metaphysical deduction, so-called, um, where he seems to just assume that we know what the logical forms are, the general logical forms. And then on the other hand, you've got the account of time determination. Um, for example, uh, yeah, the account of time determination um, in the analogies, which would be relevant here to the hypothetical form, where it turns out there's a very, there's an essential role that hypothetical judgment, causal judgment plays uh, in the in time determination. So, you know, could could you have a different logic at the level of the metaphysical deduction if you weren't looking for the form that you were trying to apply in the analogies account of time determination? It, it's unclear. I think the circularity of which you speak is something that Kant is is, is well aware of and actually addresses. I'm not sure that it's a vicious circularity though. Um, so he says, this is in the first critique at A737, B765. Uh, he says that no one can have fundamental insight into the proposition. Everything that happens has its cause from these concepts, from these given concepts alone. Hence, it's not a dogma. Although from another point of view, namely that of the sole field of its possible use, i.e. experience, it can very well be proved apodictically. But although it must be proved, it's called a principle, not a theorem, because that's a special property that it first makes possible its ground of proof, namely experience. It must always be presupposed in it. So that, that, that is the circularity right there. It makes possible its ground of proof. And I take it that Kant doesn't think that that's a problem. Um, now, one possibility would be um, that one would distinguish, and I heard some suggestion of this. I would like to hear a bit more from you about whether this is the way you would want to go uh, with defending Kant. Um, one could make a distinction between the general logical forms of judgment on the one hand and the schematized versions of the categories on, on the other. So that it's the general forms of logical judgment that make possible the experience within which the schematized categories turn out to have their use and therefore to have objective validity. Um, now, there's an, a structural relationship between the general forms and the schematized categories, but they're not identical either. I mean, schematization does, does a lot of work. Um, so I think, you know, from that would, I would think, be um, a sort of Kantian response to the circularity of which he's well aware. Um, and I wonder also, uh, on, on the side of Maimon, um, whether it isn't partly an argument about the nature of natural science itself. I know you, you brought this up and, and referred to um, Freudenthal's article. I mean, I think it's part of Weimann's view that we don't need causality, ideally speaking, within natural science. And therefore the other, the, the strong reason that he thinks Kant has for including hypothetical judgment in the list of forms uh, would disappear. And that's a view that, for example, Bertrand Russell took, but, um, that is to say about causality. I'm not talking about the forms of judgment now, but um, Russell thought that causality could and should be eliminated from a properly mathematized physics. Um, so I think it's that notion of necessitation, and you gave a very nice account of why uh, the absence of existential import allows one to sort of focus on that. It's that notion of necessitation on which a lot of contemporary views of causality really focus um, that makes it seem like it's not a logical form, it's something else. Um, it's a metaphysical notion. Um, I think Kant wants the metaphysical notion and the general logical form to be both distinct and structurally related over the same, but not everybody's gonna take that view. Um, so I wonder also to what extent you think Maimon's relationship to Wolf, and I think bringing up the Wolfing conception is very helpful, um, commits him to a more rationalist, um, mathematics-oriented view, right? So if, if the view is that um, you can sort of, you could in principle reduce a hypothetical to a categorical judgment by having a more determinate concept of the, 
um, of the subject, um, then that seems to press in the direction, first of all, of a Leibnizian metaphysics of complete concepts. And it seems to press in the direction of some sort of mathematical version of that as well, where um, the other elements that pertain to physics, again, going back to the previous talk, space and time, um, would be eliminated from the picture and you would have the I ideal anyway of a completely determinate, which would, is to say not a spatiotemporal object that we're dealing with here in the case of cause and effect. Thank you. Um, wow, there's a lot there and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do justice to, to your questions. Um, on the circularity, it's I always have this experience of trying to understand one philosophy. You go to the one before and you end up just doing this infinite process of going backwards. Um, and actually the, the idea of the virtuous circularity is what was kind of interesting me in the relationship between Maimon and Fichte. So um, yes, yeah, so that's really interesting. I don't know that I can say much about, uh, about Kant's own um, discussion of that. I know that, um, you know, Kant himself recognizes, I think, Maimon's skeptical position, but I, I get the sense that he doesn't ever really take it seriously. Um, there was a quote that I, um, if, I, if you don't mind me just sharing it, I kind of put it on an additional slide here. Um, so, you know, there's this passage in, I think it's the Transcendental Deduction, where Kant's kind of accepting that this is a position, but he's saying, well, look, you know, this is a position that Hume's forced into by, by his um, inability to recognise that, um, that the, un, you know, the role that the understanding plays in, in constructing objects. And so I wonder if, yeah, to, to Kant, it's just, you know, it's, it's his aims, well, I suppose it's quite a common interpretation, right? His aims not really to disprove this kind of scepticism. Um, but yeah, the, the idea of the circularity is being a kind of virtuous circularity. That's something I'll have to look at um, a little bit more. So thank you very much for that. Um, the schematized categories, can I, would, would you mind just explaining that to me again? I'm not quite sure I, the, the, so it's the idea that the, um, the schematized categories are the things that you'd have to look at rather than kind of the, the logical forms or the categories themselves. Mm. Yeah, well, I think the general logical forms are presupposed by any thought whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, but our development of adequately schematized categories must be something that has occurred over a long period of, of development through the history of science. So not just the notion of causal law, but if you look at community, right, it's so custom built to fit Newton's conception of gravity that it's hard to believe um, that we sort of had that developed schematism all along. I mean, in a way, Kant wants to say it was implicit, but we didn't have an explicit category of community in that way until very recently. Okay, thank you. I think I have to think about that a little bit more, <laughs> but thank you very much. That's really, really helpful. Well, can I just say a bit more in response to that what you were saying as well, because I think the issues you raise um, about psychological explanation are very interesting. I think there's, there's a fundamental difference between Kant and Maimon about the role of skepticism here. So yes, you can give a psychological account of how we came to the concept of causality, association, habituation, projection, so on and so on. But you'll never get to objective necessity and everyone agrees on that. But from Kant's point of view, the very fact that you'll never get there and therefore you're forced into a sort of skepticism about a notion that is employed, he thinks, in natural science, means that if there's an alternative explanation that saves necessity, then that's preferable. And I, I think Maimon doesn't take that view. So I think they, they differ about what results from the, the skepticism. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so in view of the time, maybe uh, we now move over to the audience. So if there are some um, short questions. Uh, yes, uh, Simon. Thank you very much. Um, just out of interest, um, I, I really like your talk, it's very, very interesting. Um, I see you sort of argue 
the Bymont's argument against Kant has, of having these two prongs, the quid facti, the reality of the notion of necessity in our experience as the one hand, and then the sort of what is the logical origin of the logical status of the hypothetical judgment. I really like how those two come together. And I was just asking whether you think maybe Kant can escape one prong better than the other of that circularity, but maybe we can say sort of in the vein of Kant, um, it's a sort of Leibnizian Wolfian notion of the predicate and subject principle that leads us to this um, likening of categorical and hypothetical judgments. It's precisely the review that this differentiates concepts and intuitions that does not want this logical picture of a predicate and subject principle. You need this third thing given an intuition to relate to concepts. Um, so that maybe one could sort of argue against Maimon that this really rests on a different logical tradition that is not necessary for Kant to take on board. And that maybe this side of the analysis that he takes from Wolf, as I think you argued, is weaker than the saying, well, we can always be humans about our experience. And doesn't natural science also need our everyday experience to make sense of causality? So what do you think on that? And do you think there is this strand of logical tradition that is at play here? Yeah, thank you. That's really, really helpful, actually. That, and that's not something that, that I'd really thought about, you know. Um, but I can see, I, I think that with maybe Paul Franks is one of the points that, that he was getting at. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I suppose then, then you'd have to kind of show that natural science requires you'd still have to derive the, the general forms in some way, right? Or you'd have to derive the the categories or, or, you know, so what would be, would you just say, okay, the, the concept of causality is necessary um, to uh, the success of nat the natural sciences. They are, there is that success, we can't deny it. Um, and so we can kind of, um, we can arrive at it that way. Yeah, okay, so so before Simon, before you um, respond, maybe you can continue the conversation uh, later on. Yes, so uh, Esma, please. Hey, uh, thank you for uh, the interesting presentation. I have two questions. Uh, oh, please, please, uh, please ask only one, Esma. Oh, yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay, then. Okay, uh, then I will uh, ask the Maimo uh, one then. Uh, do you think uh, this uh, table of uh, judgments is belongs to pure general logic or, uh, you know, in Kant there's uh, general logic and there's transcendental logic in genuine sense, maybe uh, pure general logic could be a gen in genuine sense, but also transcendental logic is a logic in Kant. And then uh, when uh, uh, we are making this uh, metaphysical deduction, we are using this uh, table of judgments for uh, categories. Do you think uh, at the end, because Maimon says, uh, 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 as far as I know, uh, uh, we need transcendental logic before general logic to be able to get these hypothetical judgments. That's Maimon's uh, idea. In Kant, do you think uh, this table of uh, judgments belongs to pure uh, logic or uh, how uh, does it belong in uh, the system of Kant's in uh, your opinion? Yeah, this was, I, I think this is a kind of related question in some sense, isn't it? Um, because obviously it's not the case that you, for Kant, I don't, well, at least as I understand, it's not the case that you have general logic and um, from that you get transcendental logic. My understanding is it's more that they have a common root, right? That they're expressions of the same kind of thing. And so um, that is something that I've struggled with in 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 writing the paper to try and work out what, what would that look like. Um, but I, I think it would be this the same kind of problem in that you there still has to be some means of determining what those forms, what those categories are. And Maimon's claim would be, well, we don't need them for the natural sciences. So even if we try and kind of work the other way and say, okay, we can determine that transcendental um, logic's correct, we'd still need to show that we need those categories for, yeah, for natural science. Okay, great. 
Esma, I hope you're satisfied. <laughs> if not, uh, you can um, push her uh, after the formal part of this session. So uh, I'd like to, uh, to turn over to uh, Timothy Franz now. Uh, so uh, Timothy graduated from the New School for Social Research and he wrote his dissertation on Maimon, of course, at the Maimonides Center for Advanced Studies in Hamburg. And in 2020, the thesis was awarded the Alfred Schutz Memorial Award in Philosophy and uh, Sociology. Uh, so um, Timothy's uh, talk today, I think, follows very nicely uh, on the discussion. Um, the title is uh, Maimon's Interweaving of General and Transcendental Logic in the Essay on a New Logic or Theory of Thinking. Thank you. So, yeah, I'll, um, I, I don't have a PowerPoint. I apologize for this. No, but I'm, I'm going to put your hand out in the chat. Yes. Um, so pl please, please go ahead. Oh, great, great, great. So, okay. So I will talk and pray that I fit everything in here into 20 minutes. So, yeah, I want to talk about Maimon's essay on a new logic or theory of thinking from 1794. And, and the argument, uh, which is intended to sort of hold it together as an organic unity, which Maimon calls an interweaving of general with transcendental logic. He also suggests in a footnote that this perfects Kant's transcendental logic. Uh, and he cautions very much that his reviewers will probably not appreciate or understand it. So, you know, I was intrigued by it. I'll try to present uh, what motivates the adoption of this argument. I'll try to describe it and then briefly if I have time, suggest how it structures some of the rest of the new logic. So fine. First, what uh, motivates the adoption of this argument? Um, in my opinion, uh, very briefly, if you take a look at Maimon's text from 1790 to 1800, I actually think he developed three radically different metaphysical systems over this time, right? The essay on transcendental new logic uh, of 1790, the world soul of later 1790, finally, uh, the new logic of 1794, which uh, does something that these other works doesn't do. It explicitly reflects on logic, uh, specifically at the logical thought that must be at the basis of any of these systems of cognition. Uh, and it bases itself explicitly on this reflection, right? And the first and most important result of the reflection is an account of the principles of logical thought. This would be of obvious value to Maimon, uh, since if you have an account of, of the principles, uh, you might have knowledge of the application of these principles, right? And he is consistently skeptical, as we've seen, about the application uh, of the Kantian philosophy, right? Sure, Kant may have uh, demonstrated the principles uh, which experience presupposes, but he, he does not uh, show perhaps how it is possible uh, that these principles grant us the type of cognition of particular objects which cognition following from principles uh, should demand. Right? And this application skepticism leads uh, naturally to the accusation of uh, circularity, which and we've just seen a, a great example of this cited from the dictionary, right? Kant presupposes um, the principles for the possibility of experience, uh, but he, he presupposes the actuality of this uh, experience uh, for the objective reality of those principles, right? As I cite this in, in, the, in the handout, right? Um, Perhaps in the new logic, if Maimon can somehow uh, address this problem of circularity, he might also address the problem of application. So in the new logic, chapter 10, he, he specifically levels the accusation of circularity against the metaphysical deduction, right? To paraphrase, uh, right, uh, Kant uh, derived all of the categories of cognition and experience uh, from the forms of judgment known to the logicians. Um, and he proceeds, uh, insofar as he does proceed according to a formal a priori principle, right? His procedure is better than Aristotle who, who, who goes uh, directly and therefore rhapsodically according to, to the metaphysics of being as such to discover the categories, right? However, uh, Kant's way is still uncertain uh, for the question is, according to which principle does logic determine these forms themselves, right? Again, this is a familiar objection Kant is not perhaps only rhapsodic here, uh, but again, uh, circular. Uh, and as we've just uh, thought about a little bit, how might, how might a Kantian address this accusation of circularity? Well, again, the formal a priori principle 
uh, of this procedure in question here must be, uh, if it's anything, it must be paragraph 19 of the transcendental dialect, uh, transcendental deduction, excuse me, uh, where we read, right, the logical form of all judgments consists in the objective unity of the apperception of the concepts contained therein, right? So if that's true, if uh, judgment brings cognition from subjective to objective unity of apperception and therefore to objective validity, um, yes, perhaps Kant's procedure is, uh, uh, has the definite advantage over the Aristotelian one, but it does, uh, it presupposes quite a lot, right? It, it presupposes some rational procedure of thought whereby those very forms of judgment in the metaphysical deduction are the relations of thought, which in fact are related by apperception in such a way that they can be exhibited as the categories, right? As the uh, conditions of all possible experience and of the objects of experience. That's a lot, right? That's, that's a lot to presuppose. And does Kant provide everything there? Actually, uh, um, this is almost a bit of an aside. Personally, I, I'm, I'm thinking he does. Uh, I'm thinking he actually provides it in the transcendental dialectic where you see the history of pure reason play out, right? From dogmatism to skepticism to criticism in a series of dialectical contradictions. And in the transcendental method, Kant describes this as culminating in the reflection of pure reason on itself, right? Uh, it is in this reflection that pure reason bounds itself to the relations of reason, which you then find in the metaphysical deduction. Um, how this works is another question, but this is what is critical about criticism, right? Experience is not bounded by the rationality of God, not by empirical custom, but by reason's reflexivity, right? Uh, critical reflexivity. So I think Maimon understood this. And I do think that somehow the, the argument of the new logic is his separation of this reflexivity from that context of the transcendental uh, dialectic and making it into the first um, fundamental move of the critical philosophy, right? So. Um, the argument goes like this, right? Uh, thought reflects on itself and discovers its principles. Those principles taken in, its, in their most general significance are the principles of general logic. Taken as principles of cognition and experience, they are the categories, right? And this is the interweaving of general with transcendental logic. And that's what Mama describes in chapter 10 as his method, right? He says, I lay the possibility of thinking a real object of cognizing a thought object at the grounds, seek to determine a priori the conditions of this possibility from the concept of real object in general, and to present them as categories or elementary concepts of all real objects. After I abstract from these, that's that which determines them as conditions of the possibility of the thinking of a real object in general, I retain only that which determines them as conditions of the possibility of thinking an object in general. Consequently, these constitute the logical forms. So you see there a uh, reflection of thought on itself, which in one way can be taken as uh, yielding the principles of general logic and in another sense is yielding transcendental logic. So hopefully now we can move to describing this argument in, in more detail. So uh, the first part of this quote, I lay the possibility of thinking a real object or of cognizing a thought object thought object will be very significant here at the ground, seek to determine operate the conditions of this possibility, right? That's the reflection on thought, which he sets up back in chapter one. So we move back to chapter one. Um, and there he sets it up by a sort of initial outline of thinking. And I'll quote again, uh, Maimon says, uh, in any actual thinking, there are five elements namely the subject, who thinks, the object of thinking, what is thought about, the thought object brought forth by thinking, the action of thinking in general, and the particular way of it. So I think that brief outline is important because it, it separates the int intentional act of thinking from the thought object. And it is that which Maimon uh, asks about. You know, what is it? Well, what is the thought object? What makes it valid of the object which it thinks, right? Section six, the end of chapter one, uh, confirms this, I believe, by saying, uh, the laws and original forms of thinking are able to be determined a priori by reflection and made complete, and logic as a whole can be made complete with respect to them. Fine, okay, so chapter two then 
actually carries out this reflection, it's difficult partly because uh, some essential elements are in fact not in that chapter, but scattered throughout the book and in other works extending, you know, at least through 1797. Um, it begins uh, again by asking, you know, what is, what is a thought object? Well, because it posits and identifies an object, it begins with the principle of identity. Maimon uses Leibniz's uh, somewhat difficult example of a regular decahedron which I now understand is a three-dimensional figure with, with 10 equal regular faces. Uh, and to think in Maimon's parlance of, uh, or the form of a synthetic judgment that a figure can be a regular decahedron, right? Well, this would be to identify what the object in question is with what it is judged to be, right? Uh, and this should result in what Maimon calls a metaphysical truth, a truth about the object as it is in itself according to its real ground. Right. Um, the problem is just given this uh, principle as it, as it is understood by general logic, uh, it is possible to truthfully identify, um, but only in a merely logical or, or nominal sense, uh, figure with regular decahedron, since it's obviously a kind of figure. And this would be simply a judgment like A is A. But that's wrong, uh, since you may learn about platonic solids, you may construct a regular decahedron and discover that this figure is not a figure, right? A is not A, or since all decahedrons are irregular, you know, this regular decahedron is not regular. You know, A, B is not B, right? Um, whether the predicate contradicts the subject directly or a predicate already thought in the subject, it's the, now the principle of contradiction, our next principle, which demands that all such contradiction be, you know, expunged, excluded from, from thinking. But, it is this principle of contradiction, which seems to be the crucial problem for Maimon in this reflection. Why? Because if it demands the exclusion of all such contradiction, it reduces sort of to another expression of the principle of identity. And as we've seen, this is not sufficient uh, to say what a thought object is or to determine an object, right? So these principles together cannot account for what it is to have a concept of a real object. As Maimon says, they determine no thought object, that is no object brought forth by thinking. And these are the principles of general logic. So it follows that general logic, since it already presupposes thoughts of objects, uh, cannot account for itself, right? It's, it's somehow deficient in, in this way. So it depends upon real thought. And it seems that real thought not only excludes contradiction, but demands it because all predicates and determinations they're unique insofar as they exclude others, right? So how can Maimon then re you know, reconcile this uh, exclusion of contradiction from the simultaneous demand for it, right? And this is a criterion for the whole reflection. If this can be answered, it seems this, you know, the reflection is complete. The answer, uh, the, the primary answer is the principle of determinability, which he um, has, has spoken about for some time, for many years, since 1790 at least, here called the first principle of all real object determining thinking, right? This principle wants to determine, it wants to state um, how the terms of a thought should relate to each other, right? If that thought is to refer to a real object. Um, the argument I think becomes clear if you ask um, how, how relational thought can refer to a non-relational or, or monadic, uh, thing, right? Um, it cannot be done, right? If both terms, subject and predicate, uh, already refer to independent, uh, to, to entities uh, independently of each other, right? Maimon says this determines no objective connection at all, uh, nor is it possible if the relation between terms uh, is grounded by the subject term and the predicate term equally. That's circular. Uh, so, the only other possibility is determinability, which describes right, a one-sided relation of dependence between subject and predicate, right? So uh, the subject can be a thought object by itself, but the predicate cannot be except in connection uh, with that subject, right? So this gives some element of necessity. And this principle becomes then the centerpiece of my month reflection, right? And it breaks down into um, 
it seems, two further principles. Uh, the next consequence uh, is the principle of uh, excluded middle. Uh, this is not in the new logic. Maimon actually carries this argument out in the pragmatic history of the concept of philosophy, 1797. Excluded middle seems to follow naturally from determinability, since if you have a concept, right, that can only be determined in precise ways, uh, well, then only one of determination of it may be affirmed and the others uh, negated, right? So Maimon will say, well, it is not from any possible pair of opposed predicates that one must be attributed to a subject given as object, but only from such predicates that stand with the subject in the relation of determinability. Okay. Uh, it also follows from this that there is only affirmation and negation, right? Uh, a determinable concept, um, for example, two possible determinations does not allow um, you know, both one determination and the other, or it doesn't allow you know, neither one nor the other, right? Um, this thought then entails the, the last principle, which Maimon never actually explicitly calls a principle, but in various places indicates it's an essential consequence, right? Uh, and it deals with negation, um, right? On the one hand, it deals with the difference between uh, immediate negation and um, less immediate, or more, even an infinite judgment, right? Uh, if there's negation within the context of a determinable concept, uh, right, right away, then that's a condition for the predication of other possible determinations. For example, you know, if this regular polygon or polyhedron is a, is a tetrahedron, right? Well, if it's or if it uh, is not, excuse me. A tetrahedron, well, then it can be some other definite type of regular polyhedron, right? Um, or if there is a negation not in that immediate context, but in some um, more distant relation, uh, for example, if you say, again, this regular polyhedron is, is, is not a decahedron, right? Well, that's the condition for, for a new and different concept uh, coordinated with the, other, with the previous one of irregular polyhedrons under which a decahedron would be uh, subordinated, right? So this seems to solve the problem of contradiction since now all concepts uh, exclude contradiction as they should, but also demand it in ways that are necessary for further, right, further uh, thought, further cognition. So that I believe is Maimon's reflection on the principles of thinking, right? Thinking, thinking itself. Um, how does it hold the rest of the new logic together briefly? Well, its first result, this, uh, this will be very summary. Uh, its first result is Maimon's account of general logic, right? Um, that's because we get this totality of interconnecting principles and they together, you know, they're, they're sort of the conceptual tree or, or matrix, which is then the basis for all thought. It's the basis for all concepts, all judgments, inferences and by focusing solely on these thought relations um, that's what Maimon does in chapters three through seven of the new logic right he goes in very in excruciating detail through concepts judgments and inferences uh, that's his account of general logic uh, but by ceasing right from abstraction from thoughts intentional relation to real objects determined in themselves and by focusing on that once again He's going to take these same principles as the categories and he'll give an account of transcendental logic. That's the interweaving. Uh, there's obviously much more to it. Uh, but first I'll mention that this seems to solve this, the problem of circular argumentation in Kant, right? Why? Because um, instead of presupposing already in experience these principles of synthetic cognition, he derives them from this reflection, uh, which is, sort of based on, on this original inability of general logic to account for itself, um, and in which thought is, you know, this reflection is forced uh, to be real thinking, right? To intend to determine objects as they are in themselves. Uh, so the good thing about this, it's, it's not just that general and transcendental logic are compatible, is that there is a, a demand inherent to thinking to apply general logic uh, transcendentally, right? Um, to reality. So, and nor, nor does this presume experience, right? So it seems to solve the circular argument uh, 
However, does it yield the possibility of experience? And that's another question, right? That's the problem again, uh, the previous one of application, right? Uh, that's an entirely new problem, which then the rest of the new logic faces. And it's a problem in this way, right? Um, sure, thought, if we buy this argument, it features the demand to, to think real objects as they are in themselves. But at the same time, this reflection has given us what? It's given us the structure of concepts and it has not given us the structure of things in themselves, right? So thought it has to accomplish this task of grasping something of things in themselves, uh, but it can't. Uh, and uh, I, am I almost done? Yes. Yeah, so if you can, if you can kind of wrap up. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I want to suggest three brief, very things. Things uh, that the problem, the principle of determinability again solves this problem uh, because it is, it demands um, it it features the demand for form and content. It has a form and content distinction, right? Um, so Maimon is able to say, well, the contents of our thought can vary as objects vary, right? Uh, and he, that's the way he, he will then derive the categories uh, as um, saying what objects uh, presuppose, uh, you know, if we are to, to intend to think them, to actually to posit them, to actually determine them. Uh, and he'll derive the categories in this way directly from the principle of determinability. Uh, he will develop uh, a method of applying the categories via spatio-temporal relations. Uh, and that leads him, you know, actually we can perhaps talk about that later, um, but that leads him to essentially solve the problem of application. And in this and later works, he'll call this system, which he establishes absolute or unconditioned cognition, right? That leaves me one final uh, aspect of his work to talk about, namely his metaphysics, uh, which is actually quite interesting. It goes oh, back sorry, to- Sorry, Timothy, also because Paul needs to leave. Um, oh, excuse me, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, don't yeah so I, think, I think if you can conclude here and then we later on we'll have time to, um, Absolutely. to discuss these other aspects. Yes, thanks. I agree. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be brief because unfortunately I've got to go at one, but that, Tim, that was a very clear account of Maimon's project and very illuminating indeed. Um, I would say that, and this relates back to the, the previous papers as well, it's not so much, it seems to me, that Maimon sort of solved a circularity problem that Kant has, but that he just makes that circularity um, much more evident. I mean, that's how I understand the interleaving um, and the key to that, it seems to me, is to include the notion of reality within the very beginning, the principle of general logic itself. Right? It's about thinking a real object. I take it from Kant's point of view, that notion of reality belongs in transcendental logic. It doesn't matter whether um, concepts have reality from the point of view of general logic at all. One completely abstracts from that question. Um, and reality really has to do with um, explanatory use within within some sort of science. Um, at the same time, as I think you also make very clear, Maimon uses a rather rationalist conception of this, which is related to Kant's own principle of thoroughgoing determination in the dialectic. So we get the idea that reality is not just usefulness within science, but it's also determinacy in some way. Um, and then we get this idea uh, that I think Kant would reject, <laughs> that we are guaranteed to have concepts or, or um, predicates, shall we say, that, that, that exclude one another. And that would therefore allow for some sort of disjunctive syllogism where you could say, well, if it's not A and it's not B and it's not C, then it must be D, because those are all of the options. Kant's view is that, that that is what rationalism requires. That's what the principle of sufficient reason requires. But we don't have such concepts in general, which is why we get what he calls infinite judgments, where we can exclude certain things, but we don't know yet what to affirm. So it's a fundamentally different 
view, I think, about the way our actual concepts go. And again, Maimon might well want to say, that's why I'm skeptical about them. But then it would seem as though by including this notion of reality in logic from the beginning, he's made it into a logic that is fit precisely for something like mathematics and not for the, the messier engagement with the, the natural world that physics and the other natural sciences engage in. Okay. Great. Uh, am I still muted? No, it's, it's okay. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, thank you, first of all, for this opportunity and thanks you for your remarks. Um, because yeah, these are, these are great uh, challenges uh, for my sense of the entire project. Uh, and what could I say in response? I, I could say, well, look, so this might not be a satisfactory answer, but you know, there are many places in the critique of pure reason where Kant will say, well, we think uh, that things in themselves are the cause of our sensations, right? Uh, that they affect us. Um, and we, we must think so because it would be absurd if um, appearance weren't of things that appear. So we, we think so. Um, and so it's unclear to me, uh, you know, as I think to many others, um, how Khan can, can justify that. Uh, I, I, I do think that um, it, it does, in some sense, follow and is justified by, by the account he gives, as I mentioned, the transcendental dialectic, ultimately. Um, but that, to me, that's what Maimon is doing from the first. Uh, we are thinking uh, in the sense in which Kant meant thinking in these cases. Uh, and it just so, tur so turns out, if there is thought, well, thought is the, such a thing that must be able to reflect on itself. So here we begin. Uh, can it do so? And no, it cannot if we only have the principles of uh, general logic. So then thought must think, uh, you know, uh, things in themselves. It does not cognize them. Uh, the question of cognition comes later. Uh, whether beings are in fact distinct from thought, uh, whether and to what degree we have cognition of them as they are in themselves, that I would respond that perhaps that, that, comes, uh, that comes later. Uh, and so, yeah, I think you're, you're right that Kant is, 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 is very much uh, against uh, what Maimon is trying to do here in a sense. Uh, but in this reflection on thinking, uh, for example, the principle of excluded middle that has come across, uh, yes, it is um, rationalistic in that it is um, systematically complete, right? Uh, yes, but again, it's just thought and what it requires formally to think about itself. And it's what it then brings to experience. Uh, Maimon does call the principle of determinability and the new logic calls it the, the principle of, of sufficient reason. To my mind, it's not the same principle of sufficient reason that the rationalists have in mind. It is one that is grounded in finite human reflexive thinking. Uh, sure, we'll bring this demand that any inner uh, or outer, excuse me, any outer relations we might encounter uh, and experience be, be reducible to explanation by inner relations systematically. Um, but nothing guarantees, I, I think that that will always happen or that it does happen. Uh, uh, but we are as thinking beings driven to um, this type of cognition of, of reality. Um, any more than that, I don't think that it says. So um, in a sense, ultimately, we are only guaranteed to have these concepts thanks to the fact that we, you know, the, the, the contingent fact that we are thinking beings. Um, thinking beings don't need to exist 
uh, but we do. And um, so I don't know if this makes sense or is an adequate response, but it's my attempt. Um, and I think also, I like one more thing, if I could, the mathematics. Yes, I, it is for mathematical construction, but I was thinking about this earlier. And the thing is, if it is to be about mathematical construction, it must be about experience because even the math that Maimon is investigating here is partly empirical, right? Um, polyhedrons are, don't follow from the principle of contradiction. We find out about them by, by experience. So, uh, okay, that's, that's it. Yes, okay, so thank you very much, uh, Timothy. So for all, for all the others, yes, please uh, remain seated. Uh, but I wanted to, uh, at this point, to thank uh, Paul Franks uh, for agreeing to participate in this event, for his wonderful uh, comments. And um, so please join me in, uh, in thanking Paul Franks because he unfortunately has to leave. Um, and then I also want to uh, conclude this, this, the formal part of this uh, session. And uh, I want to do so by um, thanking everyone else, of course, first of all, the speakers, and I also want to very briefly uh, announce our next um, event, which is in two weeks, March 25. Uh, and Hua Ping Lu Adler will give a talk on Kant on lazy savagery racialized. Yeah, so that will be a very different topic, but I hope you will find it interesting uh, anyway. Uh, so maybe we, uh, we conclude by thanking our speakers and then we continue uh, the discussion. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sorry, I have to Bye. go. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Thank Bye. you all. Thank Bye. you.